Hi, I'm Andrew Wallace, and welcome to the We've Got a Problem podcast, where each week we explore inspiring stories of struggle, success, and solutions to prevalent problems and how our guests have turned a problem into an opportunity. This week, I'm joined by Kyler and Cody McCormick, two brothers who are on a mission to inspire youth to chase their dreams. Best described as adventure filmmakers, they've spoken on stages across the country, sharing their story and encouraging others to live what they call the outbound life, a life where you believe your story matters and you live beyond your limits. I was super impressed by their story, tenacity, and personality, and I wanted to share it all with you as well. With that, let's get into it. So thank you guys for joining me on the show. I really appreciate it. One of the things that we that that I'm fascinated with is how we can kind of lead richer lives to our full potential. Mm-hmm. And that's right up your alley. Unlike most of us, you guys were both somehow emotionally mature enough at very young ages to decide to actually follow your passions, to to have not been beaten down by the world by the time that came to be something you could do mm-hmm. and just decided to do it. And you put steps in place to actually chase your, chase your dreams, chase your passions, and, and pave your own path. How did that happen? Well, so I guess here would be the secret and the uh, disclaimer is I'm not good at most things. So like going back as long as I can remember being a student, like I wasn't like an, a D and F student, but I was somewhere in the middle there, right? There was no class that it was just like, wow, Kyler's, you know, a, a scientist to be, I wasn't the, you know, the even, the even the class clown or the musician, like there was no thing that I thought I was so fantastic at. But I remember being a kid who, like, I loved movies, but even more than that, it would be the behind the scenes of a movie, right? So I would be watching the making of Pirates of the Caribbean on repeat or mm-hmm. the making of Lord of the Rings, right? There was, there was a love there. There was like a real curiosity. And I, I think for me, like there was always this vague knowing that something was storytelling. Maybe it was filmmaking, maybe it was I don't, acting. I, I didn't know what it was, but I knew I loved stories. I knew I loved entertaining people. Mm-hmm. I think uh, in my family, well, I guess Cody would be the one who could attest to this. I don't know, was I always like putting on a show for you guys? Or you, you know, always like, had something playing new. with the yeah. camera? center of attention i feel like at least in our family i'm obsessed with the attention probably not good (laughs) no but from our family standpoint you were very charismatic and you always had like a new idea and i think it was interesting because that was different in our family versus outside our family so like at school and stuff i think you were feeling the pressures of having to perform and hit these certain standards and i was like really shy I, yeah. I was really shy as a kid in school. And as, as I kind of look back on us as kids, that was interesting because in our family, you, you had these things you were passionate about and curious about, but then you'd get in school and it would kind of shut down, right? Yeah. So for, as an older brother, I was able to see some differences, even in Kyler, and then I think in myself as well of, you know, yeah. I, I think at school, like I always tended to be able to fit in a little bit better. I did excel at sports more that I felt, I, I found a bit of a community. Well, and you were never, a leader. You, you were naturally a leader. You still are, which was something that I don't think I had out of the box. Like you, if you played basketball, you became like a team captain or whatever you were doing at school, people seemed to listen to you. Like, I think you had that like leadership dimension, which I didn't. Yeah. Well, and so I think for us, it was more like it was kind of looking at life as this puzzle and you're given different pieces and they all have to fit together in the right way. So I think for us, I kind of look back to you mentioned, you know, we stepped out and started following our, our dreams. And it's like, yeah, if we look at it like that, that can that can sound, you know, like everything was. Like uh, it just fell into place, and right, the truth right. is, well, it just, yeah. Well, of course, and that, yeah. that part of it is, uh, of course, you're supposed to supposed to make your story sound better than, than... that's how it always sounds. Yeah, yeah. On, on yeah. the back end, I, yeah. I, yeah. I, personally, I, I was probably trying to escape something that just like really wasn't working. Hmm. I, I, so I, I was as a strategy, I was opting out of something, not because I had the grand strategy of like this is what I will become or this is ex- exactly what I do. I just knew I was drowning. I right. felt like a fish out of water in, uh, you know, the, the particular school system I was in. I was just like, I'm just not good at any of this stuff. So maybe if I retreat, I'll be able to figure out what I'm good at. 
Mm-hmm. You know, so, so that that's kind of where it started uh, for, for me, I would say. We did have parents that believed in us. Parents that like um, kind of said, guys, if you dream something, you can achieve that. It's going to take a ton of work, but you can achieve that. And And we acknowledge that there's so many kids that don't grow up with that. Um, but I think I've found through um, listening to different kids' stories over the years that there's always maybe someone, maybe it's a parent, maybe it's a teacher, a mentor in a different way, a, you know, a, um, a coach of a sport team or something like that. Somebody that finds a little something in you and can, and can believe in you. And if you can harness that, then that's where you can excel from. You, you just need like a little stepping stone. So I think it's always important to find what that stepping stone in your life can be. Yeah, for sure. Even though we talk about kind of having a less glamorous way into it than it might seem on the surface, that's the way that things oftentimes happen when people choose to go off and, and chart their own path to, to, to pursue a passion because they go, I don't have that much else. Um, but I know mm. that I'm passionate about this and I really want to suss that out and figure out what that is, what, and, and how I could be successful there. I don't know necessarily exactly where I'm going to fit in, but I know that that's something I, I, I can, and I'm going to do that. Sure. So you guys started the outbound life in what, 2013, sometime around there. Yeah. 13 or 14, 13, 14. So how has it gone? Has it just been all highs flying in helicopters to mountaintops and taking beautiful photographs and film? Or have there been some highs and lows? Talk to me about that. Andrew, I'm glad you asked because we've actually never had a bad day. It's pretty incredible. Things have gone perfectly from the beginning. And uh, that's that's what we intend to do. It's, It's the sun is always shining where we live. Uh, never have we, we get million dollar checks nearly every it just day come. and it's, it just come. my bank doesn't even know what to do with them <laughs> <laughs> you know it's it's funny we once did a video called the anti-highlight reel because we realized that okay so we're in the age of social media and gosh we all want to look good right we all want to show this perfect lifestyle and show this highlight reel which is glamorous but uh, to answer your question, no, I would say that the vast majority is not those moments. You know, we spend a great majority, 90 something percent of our time in meetings, in Zoom calls like we're having right now, going to trade shows, all sorts of things to try to get things going. And the reality of these things we work on is sometimes what we think is going to happen in a month takes six months or it takes right. a year or you put eight months of time into something that you're so passionate about and you've laid the groundwork for something that's just going to be a home run and then the company pulls the plug because their stocks are down. So I would say that is such a dynamic of the highs and lows of running your own business, of kind of attempting to pave your own path. But I, I will say uh, w- w- Cody and I are lucky that we have each other. You know, oftentimes it's the case that one of us is down and the other can kind of give the, the pep talk that they need. Um, and also when it's all said and, and done, I, c- I can genuinely say that we believe in what we're doing. Yeah. I-, I can genuinely say that having this mission uh, as we do of sort of telling stories of hope and adventure, you know, mm-hmm. we've kind of tried to brand ourselves pretty niche as far as saying most stories or most projects we might not be the best fit for like we've never shot a wedding video we we don't do much corporate stuff we try to be be pretty narrow in that and um just being able to run something that is ours that we do actually believe in i would say that that does sustain us even though a lot of it is not sunshine well and i think we can get the most fulfillment from that and we found that we do when we're uh, exploring these areas that we're passionate about. And there's a quote that I, I love to kind of reflect back on. It's by Richard Branson. He says, it's foolish not to become an expert at your passions. And oh my gosh, to me, that sums it all up. Like that's worth taking a risk on is, is f- you know, finding some of these things that you love, that you're passionate about, and then just devoting as much of your time and effort towards that because if you can become good at that you're gonna love it the most you're gonna be the best at it these are areas that you're gonna actually excel at versus other areas that you might just kind of um, stumble into and you're not gonna be as good at so i think 
that's where we try and focus most of our time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that's, of course, that's super key because, and I will say that I think it, it's it's quite possible to lose your way when it comes to pursuing a passion, to getting into something like that, to, to remembering what it is. Because, and I, this isn't a criticism of academia, it, it's just an observation hmm. that people tend to lose that spark or forget that it existed. Uh, and they move into to doing, I, I, I set, in a way, living a secondhand existence where they're getting their ideas, their motivation, whatever else from other people that, yeah. that they go, well, I should become a doctor because that's what people think is a prestigious position. And I want prestige and I want to be popular. And I mean, it goes back to the to the high school lunchroom, I suppose. Like, well, I want to be the popular kid that everybody's yep. coming up to, and yeah. you, you that that people forget what it's like to, in a sense, have that childlike sense of of wonder and play and yeah. passion for something, and and maybe even conflate passion for preference. That that I don't know. I, I I'm kind of dancing around it, but that's the there is a a way that 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 you actually have to do some self discovery if you've been away from it for a while to remember those things that actually light your fire. Yeah, and it's so interesting because we do. There's all these vast oversimplifications that we all kind of culturally follow when it comes to passion and career, living your dreams. You know, it's always we always uh, look at other people who are who have made it, so to speak. And we think that they just, you know, knew exactly where they're going. And then they did exactly that. And I think that we really could all use this permission to evolve because that we are all always evolving, right? We're changing our curiosity and our passions. Like when you, when you start pursuing a passion, you don't know that passion very well. And you only get to know it as you walk down this path with more definition will come and you might realize, Oh, I thought it was this one thing, this broader, low resolution picture, but the closer I get to it, I realize maybe it's something entirely different. And sometimes we catch ourselves at a crossroads where we're shifting. And it's like the person we are currently is different than that naive, you know, wide eyed, you know, kid for me who was in high school who just thought I'm going to be a storyteller or whatever. Cody and I all the time find ourselves at these crossroads where we're like, we just need to accept and be honest about where we're at right now. And even if where we're at right now is talking about how right now is a tough season. Right now might be a season of drought where it's like things aren't working. And when you're in a season where things aren't working, are you going to keep trying to talk about how everything is great? Or could you say maybe exploring how things aren't working is going to somehow unlock what I do next? Like yeah. We need permission to keep changing. Yeah. 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 For sure. And that's, I think that that comes into the concept of being kind of lifelong learners that, that if you, yeah. if you fix yourself into one particular area and, and just like, and keep pushing, pushing, pushing in one thing, you're leaving yourself, you're closing yourself off to right. possible better options, better ways of doing things, being less narrow minded about what passion is. And what your passion is and what your purpose is allows you to kind of uh, grow into what might be the the next phase. You guys believe in 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 being kind of lifelong students. Talk to me Absolutely. about that a little bit. Yeah, well, I think it's this principle, and it, it kind of rides this line of, you know, we all hear "fake it till you make it," and that principle is like okay, act like you're this expert, even though you're not this expert. So you ride that line to like, maybe get yourself indoors and try and excel. But then you also need to acknowledge, uh, you know, you've got some some areas you can learn. And I think, I think it's always going back between those and finding that sweet spot. Because um, the reality is, there is always so much for us to learn. You need to be confident in what you know and what you're an expert at and bring that value to the table. But you also have to be exploring and eager to learn from those um, that can help you uh, just gain more experience. And I think one, one uh, thing that we uh, put into practice in this area, we like to live by what's called 
I don't even know who coined this, but it's the law of 33. And it's this, this principle of where if you break your life into these three categories, um, at the top, you've got mentors. You need mentors. So it's a third of your life where you need mentors pouring into you, people that are going to call you out for, hey, you're on the wrong path. Hey, you're not good at this. You need to pivot. Then in the middle chunk, you need, you need peers, this middle 33, where you have people kind of in the fight with you in a similar, um, I would say probably a similar field to you or at least in a similar phase of life where like you're trying to get to the next level and these are all people that understand that struggle. But then at the same time, you need people that are peers, uh, that are mentees to you, people that you're pouring into. Because um, I hear so often from, you know, maybe uh, friends that are like, well, I don't have a lot to give. Well, I, I completely disagree with that. Every single person has so much life experience already that they can pour into someone else. Someone that um, could look up to you, right? With the things that, the trials that you've gone through, the experiences that you've gone through. So we look at that structure as almost like it, it's a support structure mm -hmm. that can help you have the checks and balances to really get to where you want to go. For sure. Yeah. I'll, I'll um, I, if I may, I'd love to add on to that. Uh, by, by saying part of this idea of being a, a lifelong learner is it's so specified to the individual. You really need to figure out how you learn, right? Do you learn by books? Do you learn by conversations with other people? Are you going to really excel in the classroom? So back to, again, kind of go to my origin stories and me being this kid who was like the not so great student. Well, I still see myself as that teenager with like all the same challenges and insecurities and all these different things. So a huge part of this ongoing life experiment and how I kind of organize my life now is it's I'm organizing it around how I learn. So for example, I did not go to college. Okay. Uh, Cody did. I did not. And so, but part of, part of that for me is I made a deal with myself. If I'm not going to go to college, I'm instead going to put all that time, energy, and effort into learning directly from the people who inspire me most. Now, why would I do that? Because I feel like the closer I get to the fire, the better I'm going to learn, right? If I'm really passionate about the things that these people are teaching, I'm going to ingest that versus topics that I might not be so passionate about. So even take that, that was a broad speculation. And in the last two years with Cody and I starting our own podcast, I look at that as continued learning. I view that as a way that when we have a guest come on, we might be preparing for a month just studying with tunnel vision focus that person's life and i feel the closer i get to that person the more i more likely i am to learn the lessons of their life if we connect with them they become a friend maybe they become somebody that we work with in the future so these uh i, I i'm kind of inserting myself in the classroom of uh the lives of these hand-picked people so a lot of i think what both cody and i do is conscientious about how do we learn best mm -hmm. There's a big component of self-knowledge that comes into play when we start talking about how people learn best, how people yeah. do best, what, what sets you up for success. I have my best hours in the morning. My most mm -hmm. productive time is from like 8 a.m. to noon. But yeah, yeah. From, from noon to three, that's just not a, that's not a productive time for me. So I don't schedule my productive work for that time. After lunch, I kind of want to take a nap. I don't. But that's the kind of just, you start dragging, it's been in it, it's the sameness, take a break. So that's the time I go to the gym. Hmm. You go, just leverage your your natural thing. That's yeah. the case in, I think, and a, a big lesson for us all, is to leverage that same self-knowledge in, in life. How do you learn best? What, what works for you? And certainly, again, what you, not anybody else. There's a concept that, uh, that Cody mentioned of the of the three step thing that the the, the, yep, the yep, law of thirty three right yeah. so that a big one for me and and something I want to highlight is the fact at, and personally I say to myself well I am not an expert so I can't teach somebody how to do it I mean not always mm. but there are times that you sit there and go I don't know enough about that to to call myself an expert to to hold myself out there. But the thing is, I probably am two steps ahead of a lot of other people. Yeah. And that's all you need to be to maybe yeah. help somebody out. 
exactly. when somebody's asking for when somebody's asking for help, somebody needs a little guidance. You go, you know, I'm and you be honest, right? Hey, I'm not an expert in this, but I do know this, 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 and this, and and this is kind of what worked for me. Maybe you could try that. Have you thought about this? Oh, wow! And and perhaps help somebody out, which is pretty well, cool. I, yeah, yeah, and I think. Um, it's that what I was talking about of that balance of like you you have to remain humble in it, but have the confidence that you know what you do actually have some life experience that you can provide to others. And I think there's so much. Um, I think when you take the time to pour into someone that has questions that you know they're they are two steps behind you, um, it's very fulfilling. Like it actually gives you a lot of purpose. Yes, and and, that's, it, and that's, it's, it t- it teach you learn too while you're doing it. A hundred percent. Yeah. And you become a better communicator. You get to actually have the introspection of breaking down some of the steps that you went through that you might not have done unless you're literally having to break it down and teach it to someone else, right? You know, uh, my wife and I, we have a lot of friends who are teachers and it's, they have to become experts at this topic so that they can then translate that down to someone else. And it's not until you're teaching something that you almost become the expert yourself. Man, isn't that the case? And there's a, there's a component also of being... Uh, of moving between phases, right? I am the teacher, I am the expert, and I'm the experimenter. And there's you can be in 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 all three phases at the same time. I'm experimenting yeah. while I'm teaching and trying to be the expert. And I, th- that's part of the to 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 never believe this again, children, to never believe <laughs> that you are the expert full stop. Yeah, well, I think that's I think that's the balance right there. Like we're saying, it's it's confidence and humility. It, yeah. It's somewhere in that sweet spot where you are. Sometimes you're a bit more of a teacher. Sometimes you're a bit more of a student. But we have to just approach all of life with that perspective. This idea that even you know, oftentimes Cody and I we have this this wild idea about a new project or a new podcast guest or whatever it might be, and you know, there's that little voice in the back of our heads, there's the resistance, and you could call it fear, doubts, insecurity, that says, why would you even try? Why would you even attempt that? You're not qualified, you're not ready. It's not possible. You know, it's not possible. There, there's a million reasons not to try, but I love this idea of uh, these two things are, are simultaneously true, that anything is possible. And when I say anything, I mean like, if your goal is go, to go to space or like date Taylor Swift, I don't know, like anything. I want to bit, paint that with like a capital A. Anything is possible, but also nothing is guaranteed. Right. So that means that any attempt, any wild idea we have, we want to reach out to, it's like, well, anything that includes that thing that could be possible, but it's not guaranteed. So I'm not going to be entitled. I'm not going to expect that it's going to happen because nothing's guaranteed to us. Yeah, I think that's just a balance that we all have to live with. But we should be confident, but we can't be we, we, we can't be egotistical. Yeah, Well, I think that's that's actually I was just reading a book by um his name's David Rubenstein. I don't know if you've heard of him before. He runs the Carlisle Group. It's a big investment firm. I knew the um, name sounded familiar. Yeah, yes. he's he's a phenomenal interviewer, and he has this amazing interview series on YouTube. Um, he he believes most Americans don't know enough about American history, how we got here, the ideologies it was built on, the experiment of what America is. It's truly this experiment. It's this idea, and it's certainly not perfect by any means. But there is something that this American ideology has that sets us apart from the rest of the world. And it is this idea that, you know, call it capitalism or whatever it is, um, there is something about if you have a dream and idea, there is that possibility you can achieve it. Yes. There is also that possibility you can fail miserably and not make it. Well, that's that. That's the. That, and that's the hard one, hard pill for people to swallow. Is, yeah, it's tough. Yeah. Uh, that, 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 that's the land of opportunity thing. I mean, in, in a nutshell, is you have the opportunity, but you also have the risk. The cool thing about America for me, commenting on that, just because I sure. honestly have thoughts on everything. Um, it's maybe my problem. The The cool thing for me is that uh, the United States is... is pretty much the only country that was that that didn't have a history beyond the the few 
relatively years of, of being a colony where the country has always been democratized, that, mm. that your ideas belong to you. So yeah. if you have a, a thought to, to invent something, some brand new thing, you have the ability to, to monetize, to earn the, the, the fruits of your labor from your intellectual property. Right. And it doesn't belong to the state and it doesn't belong to the king and it doesn't, it, 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 nothing has, we don't have a long history of those things being taken from us. But yeah. that also means that we have to bear the brunt. There is no large public state to take that, uh, to 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 be the big cushion if that doesn't pan out. Yeah. Well, and that's the scary thing is, I mean, if you're not good enough, you fail, right? If your business idea isn't executed the right way, you fail. You can't provide for yourself. And that's the reality of how this, this system functions um, is that it truly weeds out the business ideas that shouldn't be working. And there is not that cushion that you're just going to keep getting funds to keep operating. Like, no, you get put out of business. Right. The market speaks and the markets. It's a harsh reality. Again, yeah. people, it's a hard pill for people to swallow. But I, I feel like if you tell me the rules, like just what are the rules in this sandbox? Then I go, got it. I can play in the sandbox. You guys uh, have a, a, a strong uh, a belief <laughs> that it's important to see yourself as the hero in your own story. Hmm. Tell me a little bit more about that. So, um, you know, stories are so powerful and it's, it's fun talking to you because obviously you, you've you been a movie producer yourself. Your dad has has done the same. You come from the story world and you could appreciate narrative as much as anything else. But I think so many of the ideas that we hold on to become self-fulfilling prophecies, right? You have a, a salesman who goes door to door and when he knocks on the door, they open up and he says, you wouldn't want to buy this now, would you? <laughs> Do you think those people are going to buy from him? Like, no way. No. So we, the way we see ourselves really determines the potential of every single day that we live, and, and that makes up our life. Um, I really uh, have this firm belief that, you know, every single human being is unique in, uh, and valuable in their own way. Um, I, I just got my first tattoo ever, and, and people might not be able to see this because they're listening, but it says, uh, gosh, it's kind of tough to see. It says, become, become who you are. Become who you are. And I love this idea that whenever, when each of us is born, you're born, there's just one of you. And you can spend your entire life trying to figure out who is that person, right? That's the kind of self-awareness mm -hmm. of playing to your own strengths. But the beautiful thing of it is you get to spend your entire life really trying to figure out who that person is and live from those strengths that I would argue were there since the day you were born. You just have to, you have to put in the work, quite frankly, to, to uncover the potential that was there all along. Yeah. And I think one of the funny uh, ways that we frame this sometimes is if you live life as though there's a documentary crew uh, following you around, filming your life, would you make any different decisions? Right. So you think about that from a perspective of what you do every day. And if you had a film crew with you, you know, are you going to sit down on the couch and watch four hours of television at the end of the night? Or are you going to go and, and pursue something that you're you're curious about and grow? Right. I think if the film crew is there that day, you'd probably be at the gym a little longer and you'd probably be trying to grow your business a little bit bigger or something like that. Right? And we have to find balance. We certainly have to find balance because none of us is a rock star 24 seven. And there is such thing as uh, as much as we need self-improvement. I think that's so vital to just human existence. We do need self-compassion. We do. Uh, you know, you're not always going to be waking up at 4 a.m. every single morning and, you know, knocking out. So it, it, it's a balance. But I do think, yeah, if you see yourself yeah. as a hero and strive to live that way, it's, it's going to help your life. It's, it's an idea, right? If you, can, if you can lean into that idea a little bit, it's a motivator. Everyone's motivated by different things. But as we were talking about before, like for me, opportunity is a big motivator. Just that, that idea that anything is possible, that every day I wake up, 
there's endless potential and it's up to me to like go and and grab that and achieve that and put effort in to uh you know progress what i'm tr striving for um so yeah i mean i think if i think it's a powerful metaphor it helps me if i think about uh man if if uh, i was getting filmed today you know I'd probably work a little bit harder. That in itself is enough of a motivator to keep me pushing forward. Yeah, and I think if you see yourself as the hero in your story, I think self-compassion does have to come along with that because you're like, yep. I am, I, I, the hero also needs to rest, right? That's the... Yes, or I was just going to add, though, we're talking about working towards something, right? So I think we have to identify a mission first. Yes. Or I, I like to say, like, identify a why, and um, Simon Sinek talks a lot about that. He's got a phenomenal book out, Start With Why. And it's it's really taking a deep dive on yourself and helping you understand what your why is. And it, at least for Kyler and I at The Outbound Life, it's to inspire others to live with passion, intentionality, and purpose. So if that's, if that's our mission, is what I'm doing every day adding up to that? Is this new project that I'm pursuing helping me get closer to that goal? and helping me achieve that mission because that mission is fulfilling to me. Um, so I think, yeah, it, and it's the, I will say the target is always adapting, right? It's, it's not like you come up with your why, there you go, you're set. And for the rest of your years, pursue that. Yeah, Maybe I wish. It, that is for some, but that's not for me. Like we're, <laughs> we're always continually learning and adapting that. Um, but if you don't, solidify a target you're guaranteed not to hit it right 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 it, it, it's the aspiration right cody to your point we're not always going to hit that and some of these things are impossible to actually arrive at because what is it these are uh you know abstract ideas like perfection or you know some of these things are actually not tangible it, it is a name more than it is something that actually exists but even having uh it, it's really helpful even to have aspirations out there that we can orient ourselves around well having the aspirations rather and and the inspirations like this is where i'm trying to go i may not get there but yeah. i'm gonna get closer i'm gonna right. i'm gonna move toward it yeah, there's that quote. Maybe it's Jeff Bezos. Isn't half the stuff on the internet by Jeff Bezos, and maybe the other is attributed to Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> but but it goes um, uh, stubborn on the vision, flexible on the details. Yeah. So yeah, it is something like it, it, you can have both, and and I think you need both. But you, we can't be too stuck in our ways that we can't adapt as we're growing and as we're yeah. learning. For sure, for sure. So I want to cover just a few things if you've got. Uh, a minute to to knock this out. Some things I kind of ask everybody, what do you think the biggest fallacy is in your business and and perhaps in general, the biggest lie that that people tell themselves uh, both in your business and, and in general? What do you think? I would say specifically in our business, so video production, storytellers, uh, most people think we're out shooting every single day. And that's just not the reality. So much of our business is actually, um, you know, taking meetings, working on pre-production, developing story, and then a much smaller portion is actually outperforming the production side of it. So I don't think as many people realize how much um, pre-production goes into creating compelling projects. Um, it's not you just show up and figure it out as you're there and shoot it like no you need to plan for 10 days and then go out and shoot for three days and then you're in post-production for a long time so i think there's just specifically in our industry that's a big misconception for sure yeah, it, it, this one might be cliche but I, I think just this idea of patience like we're so outcome obsessed uh, especially when social media is so rampant and we're all comparing ourselves to everybody else and different arbitrary metrics that we think were failures when in reality, I, I, I think we, we need to all with whatever we're doing, it could be business with life, however, we're trying to uh, grow as individuals. Um, things take a lot longer than we want them to take. Like, yeah. I just think that's universally true, like any great relationship, anything. And I look back you know, even with Cody and I starting this podcast that we've been doing, and we've been doing it for uh, going on a couple years now, um, 
you know, it's not that we've even had a million, well, not, not a million, but like hundreds of guests on our podcast. You know, some of these pursuits take a really long time and uh, a lot of uh, energy goes into each of these things. But for us, I think just taking baby steps, like one, one step at a time, even if it's like one thing we did a month or we put a little bit of time over the course of, uh, of a week, that all adds up. Yeah. And, and that adds up in whatever you're doing. So I think... Um, don't, I would say to people, don't be discouraged with where you find yourself right now. Realize that you probably even in the last year have learned a lot more than you realize you've learned and that um, trust the process, be, be proactive, but do trust that, uh, you know, it, it, it's adding up to something that's going to make sense the, the longer you do it. And that's okay. You're For not sure. in a rate. You're not For in a sure. Yeah. And that's, I think, a, a big component for us in, in the movie business, and I can totally associate with this. It, it's so, so important to remember that things take way longer than, than you think, and it's not going to be perfect the first time, and you're going to have to revise it. That, that whole planning piece, which, by the way, and this is, again, my commentary, talking too much, but my commentary on a lot of beginning podcasters, YouTubers, content creators in general, it's not that they're lazy, but that they don't understand the value of coming into something prepped and ready to, yep, to prepared. That, you know, I mean, you guys, I'm sure have seen the times when you prepped a little bit less. And I'm sure there was never a time where you didn't prepare at all because God right. knows, but that you've seen the, the benefit and the value of going in with, with all the I's dotted and the T's crossed yeah. to be prepared to do what you thought you were going to do. Now, I'm sure things change, right? Got to shift on the fly uh, and, and all that. But when you go into something with a script, with a, with a plan, with, a, with the work done to have thought through it, now you can leverage and, and play with what comes along and, and have fun while you do it because you're not having to do all that thought at the same time that it's happening. Yeah. When right. you have the game plan, you have the freedom to be flexible then. Exactly. Now, and, and <laughs> yeah, I was going to mention even on like documentary style shooting, when it's like, oh, go and capture the reality of life that happens. <laughs> it's not just that still. It's prep, plan, be all set so that then you have the freedom to go with the flow and go with the reality, the, you know, the actual life that's happening. Yeah. This, I don't know why all my quotes today are like, potentially Abraham Lincoln, but this one I believe is Abraham Lincoln where he said, it was about preparation. He said something along the lines of, if I had six hours to cut down a tree, I would spend the first four hours sharpening my ax. Man, that is, it's also the case with writing that, hmm. that every writer takes a different tact. Uh, Aaron Sorkin is one of those who outlines uh, obsessively and, and really hones and refines before he actually sits down to write the script. And there are others who throw themselves in and just 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 write and see kind of what they've got and then try and sort through it. Both are both are functional. Both are kind of prepping for the real draft. But if you if you come into something with with an intention and a game plan, like you say, a, a possible way, one way. Right. I've got my plan for one way I could achieve this. Now I'm open to other ways when we get into it, but I have an idea for how we might attack this. That gives you a chance to, to again, not be doing the thinking simultaneously while things are happening. Cause then you can't, you can't grab onto it. That, that, that precious moment that you could have captured is gone when you haven't even thought about being open to, to that moment, to, right. to, to being ready to capture it, to having yep. two cameras going to whatever it is in the, in the moment. Absolutely. Well, that's powerful. And you hit the nail on the head there. Something as simple as an intention. That is really powerful. That little tip, and, and, and we can apply that wherever in life, just going into things with an intention. Wow, that's that's massive. And anybody can do that. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, okay, last question. What's kind of the most unexpected, magical, awesome surprise place that, that your work has taken you guys so far? You know, I, oh yeah, <laughs> Cody, who's going to uh, do it first? I don't, I don't mind. Okay, here, uh, let me take a stab at it. <clears throat> Years back, I think it was 2019, we're doing a project with Southwest Airlines, 
out in the Bahamas. And they had prepped us for this project where we're supposed to come in and we're going to be doing a kind of a promotional piece around one of their new uh, travel initiatives coming up. And it was that families could win this trip to the Bahamas. So they said we were going to go do some of these activities, um, some, you know, fun sightseeing, all that sort of stuff. Take a little plane to some of the little islands in the Bahamas, you know, see some dolphins, all that sort of stuff. And, and then they said, you know, guys, part of it is we're going to be giving away a, an experience that families can go see sharks. And, you know, naturally we're like, wow, that sounds exciting. And this whole project ended up being tied in with Shark Week. So it was a promotion for oh, Shark awesome. Week. So we're like, all right, cool. Yeah, send us to the Bahamas. Let's go. You know, we'll take photos of like, how do you see the sharks? All that sort of stuff. And they're like, oh, well, you know, this is a promotional thing. We're not going to try and scare people. You're not going to be like, you know, near these sharks or anything like that. Yeah, but it's for a family, right? Yeah, it's family, family fun, fun you know? Safe so anyway we we uh i think it was the day we're flying out to the bahamas that we're in another briefing and one of the uh one of the people we were working with they were like so are you guys excited to swim with the sharks and we're like oh okay so sure enough they were flying us out here to board a boat with um this international dive team that films all the shark week content of swimming with Caribbean reef sharks. So sure enough, we get on this boat and they put Kyler and myself in wetsuits. They tell us to jump in the water with snorkels and look down because the sharks are going to be way down there in the water below us. So we just kind of continue with this plan. And, um, you know, I don't think we really had much time to think about what we were doing. But anyway, we find ourselves in the water. Like, all right, we're doing this thing. We're swimming in the water. The sharks are below us. All of a sudden, one of the dive instructors jumps in. He's got this cage. It's a little, like, three-foot cage. Now, we're not in the cage. We're literally in open water. But he's got this cage, and it's full of chopped up dead fish. He's 20 feet below us in the water, and he starts to pull this dead fish out of this little cage, feeding the sharks. So the sh more and more sharks start coming Kai, how many sharks do you think were down there? A lot. I, I mean, at least... <laughs> I mean, 20? Is that an exaggeration? I, I don't think 20, that's an I would say 20 plus sharks, and they yeah. were the size of us. But then as we progress, the diver starts swimming higher and higher towards us. So there's also, at the time this we're in the water, there's a discovery team on the boat filming us in the water. And my wife was also on the boat, and she was... She later told us the story that the, di the, the discovery team was saying, hey, you know, we really need to get the money shot where the sharks are like jumping out of the water and splashing in the water like <laughs> by Cody and Kyler. So basically what happened is this dive guy came right up to where we were throwing dead fish in the water around us. These sharks the size of us literally were running headfirst into us to get the fish. And we were just like floating there in the water. Well, so, all these questions start popping into your head. Am I supposed to avoid eye contact with them? <laughs> uh, what happens when I go above water again to get the salt water out of my goggles and my feet are down below flopping? Like, what if I kick one of them in the face, right? There's a lot of questions that you suddenly have. Well, is their vision so sensitive to movement? Do yeah. I need to, <laughs> yeah, do do I need to stay perfectly still? Yeah. If I close my eyes, am I still here? Like, yeah. I don't even, yeah, you yeah. know, so many things were going they through my mind. They had to bite at, yeah. 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 yeah, it was one of those experiences of, you know what? Yeah, I'm kind of glad I didn't have enough time to uh, think and prepare going into that because I don't know if I would have done it. But I will say, now I want to go dive with great white sharks because that was pretty exciting. Yeah. Gateway drug. Hey, I'll, uh, and I'll try not to ramble on this story too much, but Cody, it, it, it's funny how it follows a similar uh story projection just as like going into it we didn't really know what we were expecting um we were working on a project with a, a client camping world and they have rv dealerships all over the country and basically they said guys if you could go on the dream project uh dream road trip rather where would you go what sorts of action you know adventure -y things would you do basically go do the bucket list road trip that you've always dreamed of 
we hit up a, a buddy of ours who's a professional rock climber and he does a bunch of commercials and, you know, basically just rigs like insane things full time for a living. He said, guys, I'm going to, I'm going to sign you up for quite the adventure. And we end up going hang gliding and we, 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 we do all these fun things around kind of the, the West coast. Um, but it, it all kind of boiled down to, uh, Southern Utah, Moab, Utah to be specific. And, leading up to this project he said guys there's two different climbs that you could do and he sends us youtube videos of both of them you know it's like a person with a gopro and you get to see what it was like for them to climb this particular rock climb and he sends us the first one and we're watching this guy climb this kind of like massive arch and it's super high up and it's really thin and we're like well that looks absolutely insane and we're like i don't, I don't know if we're comfortable doing that you know, hopefully the second climb is going to be easier. And he goes, oh, no, 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 that was the easy one. <laughs> that was like the total beginner's one. But watch this other one. It's way cooler. And so we watch it, and there's these spires in southern Utah, and they're just like these towers, and, and they range from 300 to 450 feet up. And he says, I want to put you on the tall one. These are called the Fisher Towers. And he's like, here's the deal, guys. Uh, I know it's scary. You know, you have to get over that, but it's totally safe. I've brought up people who are less experienced than you, and they're totally capable of it. And so I think going into that trip, we were leaning towards the first climb, but he ends up, you know, he's very charming and charismatic and he convinces us that we're capable to do the second climb. So that's where we end up going. And as we're driving out to these spires, we're seeing them appear in the desert. There they are. And they're, they're like way bigger than we expected. And he said, now the one rule is if it rains like one day before in a 24 hour period, you can't climb because this isn't granite rock. This is essentially it isn't limestone it's essentially glorified mud where if it rains this is not going to be very safe to climb and these little you know pieces of rock that you're holding on to are going to crumble under your hands so we're kind no. of like okay hard pass well, well we're driving up and sure enough it's really cloudy we get there we get to the base and it starts to drizzle so we're like yeah we're, we're not going to do this this is not a good thing and he's like well I'll tell you what, it's drizzling like off to the side. Let's give this like 30 minutes. And sure enough, the clouds end up clearing. So we're going to climb this, this massive I've been holding my breath listening to this yeah. story. Well, I'm sitting here like... Right. <laughs> right. So we, we have a crew of four. It's a super small, nimble crew. And we end up going up this thing. It takes about, Cody, was it around four hours? Four hours? Yeah, I think to it was like the... three to four hours. Yeah, it was uh, in climbing. It's a multi-pitch, so... You'd, it's not just one rope length of like 200 feet. You have to literally get to a point, rope up again, go to another point because it's like 400 feet up in the air. Wow. So anyway, wow. you fast forward a few hours. Uh, it's Cody and I. We have one other camera guy and then our climbing guide, the four of us. And we end up taking turns. So one person would go up and stand on the summit at a time. They would go up and the next and the next. And at a certain point, you uh, kind of decide I'm going to either freak out or I'm just going to, you know, be, be pretty chill and, and relaxed up here and just accept that it is what it is. It it all boiled down to everybody had summited except for me. It was finally my turn. Cody was going to rappel down and send the drone up to get the shot of me standing on this thing. But the only problem was the sun was starting to set. It was getting darker. And real suddenly, the, the mood shifted from, oh, we're relaxed, we're taking our time, to our guide was suddenly like, hey, we need to hurry, we need to do this now, get on the ropes. And it's like, okay, we're rushed. This is not what you want to hear when you're about to do the most intense thing you've ever done. So you end up climbing up this really awkward spire and, and get to the top. And they call it the pizza summit because the, the, the piece that you stand on is about the size of a large pizza. And sure enough, you know, I stand up on that thing. Cody sends the drone up. I'm just trying to like d not freak out, not lose my mind, right? And uh, he gets a shot and I start climbing down, but then he walkie talkies up to our guide and he says, hey, could I put one more battery in that thing? I just want to do it one more time. <laughs> I'm like, might, might as well shoot it again, you know? Yeah, I'm like, Cody, if you don't kill me doing this, I'm going to kill you when I get down. This is just <laughs> like my worst nightmare. So I end up climbing all the way back up on that thing and that was the shot that we used. I'm glad I went back up, even though I it's wanted to It's made our, our demo reels for years past. Yeah, I was going to say, that's that's the money shot. That's, it's the money that's, shot, yeah. 
I was never more happy to be back on the ground after that was done. But um, we live to tell the tale. On <laughs> if, if you check out our, we just released a new director's reel on our website, and it's, I don't know, it's probably in the first 10 seconds. So you can see what Kyler's talking about. Kyler's scariest day of his life, maybe. Well, guys, thank you so much for joining me. You've had a wonderful, awesome adventure so far, and I'm sure there's much more to come. If you want to know more about Kyler and Cody McCormick, check out theoutboundlife.com or on Instagram at the underscore outbound underscore life. Thank you so much, and we'll talk to you next time.